It's okay if you do not have your scripture journal, grab a Bible. Guess what? They are just as sufficient, if not better, because it contains the whole council. Tonight we are. Oh, yes. Pens. Very good. Thank you for keeping me on. Ten, ten, ten. Pass them around, pass them around. All right, so we are going to be in Matthew 5 tonight. Uh, let's kind of quickly review where we've been. Uh, we're going through this Gospel of Matthew, uh, where really the theme is Jesus is King. He is the Messiah that the Old Testament has looked forward to, anticipated, prophesied about. And he has finally arrived here in Matthew. We saw the lineage. Uh, we saw the nativity narrative in Matthew 1. We saw the visit of the Magi in uh, chapter 2. And then in, verse, uh, in chapter 3, uh, we saw kind of Jesus' coronation as king. We saw that John the Baptist uh, was kind of his herald, proclaiming the way, preparing the way for the king to arrive. Jesus arrived. We see the Trinity, uh, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, present in uh, Jesus' baptism. And then in, uh, the, in chapter 4, uh, we looked at... Uh, two weeks ago, we saw uh, the temptation of Jesus uh, in the wilderness... And then last week, we looked at Jesus beginning his earthly ministry, uh, really with those two words, follow me, what uh, the cost of being a disciple is, and really what the cost of not being a disciple is, and how much greater that uh, is for us. And tonight, we're going to look at uh, the Beatitudes. So the Beatitudes, uh, this is the kickoff of the Sermon on the Mount, uh, what most people would say is the greatest sermon ever preached by the greatest preacher that has ever lived, Matthew 5 through 7. It's the first of five discourses in the Gospel of Matthew, uh, set aside blocks of teaching. Uh, almost all of them are immediately followed by uh, healing, uh, as we talked about last week. Uh, the three main tenets of Jesus' earthly ministry are preaching, teaching, and healing. Uh, so we're seeing that work, word and deed are both crucial for uh, Jesus' earthly ministry, and he shows this here, modeling for us how we are to live our life. This sermon, obviously, if you were to read chapter 5 through 7, it would take you 10, maybe 15 minutes. Jesus' sermon probably a little bit longer, um, and this is a good summation of what that is. When we read this, though, we need to keep in mind that the Sermon on the Mount does not teach men and women how to live to get into the kingdom, but how men and women who are in the kingdom should live. You could almost decide or term this as a discipleship discourse. As we're looking at Matthew and specifically the Sermon on the Mount, we cannot read this apart from keeping the end of the story and the end of the, God, of the Gospel of Matthew in mind. The cross of Christ is leaning, looming. Even though it's not happened yet, we know that it's coming. And so when we read this, when we're interpreting or we're studying, we have to keep that in mind. If we come away from the Sermon on the Mount with just an impossible, crushing laundry list of to-dos, then we, uh, things that we must do to be accepted by God, we will have read it horribly wrong. We know that we are not, not accepted by anything we do, but we are accepted by God completely and totally because of a perfect Savior who died a gut-wrenchingly horrible death in our place, and he rose in victory over sin and death. We don't do this for acceptance by God. We do this as believers because we have been accepted by God. Okay? So, so that's a key thing to keep in mind. We look at this is so much more of people, especially that... Uh, don't grow up in church, they don't study the Bible, they see this, oh, at the surface level, just a moral lesson. This is where they get that Jesus was a great teacher at the very surface level, but this has so, so many deep applications. We're going to spend a few few weeks in the Sermon on the Mount. Take some time, really chew, because there are nuggets here that will transform the way you live your life, and the way you read the Bible, and the way you look at Jesus. So, with me in chapter 5, uh, verse 1, 
So as we said, uh, Jesus was ministering to great crowds at the end of chapter 4, and we're going right into that. Chapter 5, verse 1, Seeing the crowds, he went up on a mountain, on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him. So immediately right there, we should keep in mind, this is the posture uh, that a, a rabbi would have when he was teaching. So when he's reading the scriptures directly, right, when, when Jesus gets up in the temple and he says, you know, he reads that, that scroll from Isaiah and says, I've come, and basically announces, I am he that I'm reading about. He's reading scripture, so he's standing up. When he's just teaching, the rabbis would sit down. And so uh, think about it. Jesus is sitting. His, rabbi, his uh, disciples are kind of the inner circle. And we've got to believe that there's another concentric circle of the crowds that are behind them. They didn't just disappear out of thin air. He's teaching not just to his disciples, even though they're the main audience, but the crowds are gleaning the insight that Jesus is giving. Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth and taught them. Next one. Yep. Yep. Next one. So blessed are the self-sufficient in spirit, for they don't show weakness or need any help. Blessed are those who celebrate their sin, for their sin isn't as bad as that other person's sin. Blessed are the self-interested, for they are not bothered by being out of control. Blessed are the self-righteous, for they will feast on their empty good works. Blessed are the merciless, for they, they will come back to them. Blessed are the impure in heart, for they will only see darkness. Blessed are the troublemakers, for they will remain spiritual orphans. Blessed are those who compromise their beliefs to avoid persecution from their friends, for they do not hold the kingdom of heaven in high esteem. Blessed are those who seek the praise of men, because your resistance to boldly proclaim Jesus and probably offend others signals that you are not a disciple. Enjoy these earthly rewards because your reward surely does not rest in heaven. Now, pause. Your translation isn't wrong. Okay. Um, this is not. No, this is. I probably lost you at the beginning of verse 3. You're like, um, that's not it. As I was reading this, studying it in my own time, praying about it. I genuinely thought, what is the inverse of these? What is the earthly perspective, the, the me attitudes, <laughs> trademark, copyright, what are the me attitudes that we from an earthly perspective would have when we look at these? What is not even necessarily the opposite, but the earthly aspect of the beatitudes? It's really how we look at everything. It's me-centered, me-serving, what benefits me and what's easiest? We've looked down this list of the, the me attitudes that I compiled. Really, that's what is in our nature. That's what comes easiest to us. But the difference is this is the earthly perspective. We're going to read when we actually read the Beatitudes has a heavenly perspective, heavenly and eternal significance. Seeing beyond the temporal, the right here, the right now, the convenient. Because the Beatitudes, you're following, they're not easy, right? Again, these are not um, a recipe for being a Christian by any means. It's not what I'm saying. But for following them, from an outpouring of a transformed heart, they're not going to be easy. So let's actually dive into the Beatitudes in verse 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So when we look at the Beatitudes, uh, there's 8 to 9, depending on how you break up uh, verses 10 through 12. Uh, we'll get to that in a second. The first four are kind of vertical, really how we are relating to God, um, how we are dealing relationally with God. And the last four or five are horizontal, how we are dealing with God other believers, non-believers in the world, other people around us in our mission field. So, verse 3, uh, the poor in spirit. What this really means is that uh, a few of these are taken out of context, they're misconstrued and whatever. We're going to kind of myth bust them tonight. That poor in spirit means a deep humility that recognizes how spiritually broken beggars who cannot claim personal righteousness in front of a holy God. Deep humility that recognizes how spiritually broken. So right off the bat, that, that's how you're approaching how, how we are to relate to God, right? The first four are kind of vertical. 
approaching them with a humble attitude, knowing that we have nothing to offer God. But this is a good thing, right? That, that, that's not just blessed are the poor in fear. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. John Piper said that so well, everybody, whether they sense it or not, is powerless without God and bankrupt and helpless and unclean and unworthy before God. But not everybody is blessed. Those people that recognize, that they, they realize that this is the attitude I need to have before God. This attitude is an outpouring of a transformed heart. It's not something that we can do on our own, that we can gut out, that we can will. We can't make ourselves do any of these things because that just broke morality. We have to approach him well. Do we see this way before God? And if so, that's good. Well, let's keep going. Verse 4. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Uh, this, uh, these two really kind of go together, three and four. Uh, the same theme is in Isaiah 61 when it's predicting, it's prophesying about Jesus has the same role that he reads uh, about himself in the temple to really announce his earthly ministry in Luke. And that he gets up and says, Hear ye the, the proclaim the Lord the work of the Lord, the year of the Lord's favor. That that seems poor in spirit, and those who mourn are both. He personifies himself actually in Luke 4, 18 and 19. He personifies himself that he is the one that takes care of those that are poor in spirit, and he comforts those who mourns. In this, Jesus is encouraging us to wait on the Lord's salvation, knowing that the promises that are in Isaiah 61 will also be ours. The spiritual paupers there are today that, that are living in spiritual poverty will soon be spiritual billionaires in God's eternal kingdom. This morning here, again, another one that gets taken out of context. Mourning here signifies deep repentance and sorrow over sin. There, there is a time and a season for mourning over, over loss and earthly issues, by, for sure. But this is specifically talking about sin, our own sin. You are crushed in your heart and soul over sin, and you're realizing that the price it required was our Lord on the cross. This type of mourning requires a change of heart. We talked about the last couple weeks. But when you truly encounter Jesus, when you truly submit and follow Jesus, you cannot act the same way, you cannot think the same way. It's a total transformation of the heart that outpours into actions. He doesn't immediately say, change your actions here. But instead, change your spirit. James Merritt, I love this quote. He says, the world tries to change a man from the outside in. But Jesus changes a man from the inside out. From the inside out, an outpouring of comfort. Not only comfort, but, but supreme joy. Joy that only Jesus can provide. Verse 5, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. When we think about meekness, uh, we think about um, gentle, right, right? We think about all these things. It's essentially here we're talking about submitting yourself, humbling yourself enough, where you're essentially saying, Jesus, you, you know far above I the plans that I keep trying to create, these key things that I keep trying to meddle, I submit them to you because I know that you know more than I. You know the real and best plans for me. Only two people in the Bible are recognized for their meekness. Moses in Numbers 12. We're going to see in a few chapters Jesus in Matthew 11. The I am gentle and lowly in the heart passage where he self-identifies that he is meek. Verse 6, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. You think about uh, when, when we're hungry, right? we're so used to being on routines, right? You know, oh, it's dinner time, right? You know when it's dinner time, you know when it's breakfast time, and if you skip a meal or whatever, you, are, you just want to get 
you want food, you want water, you want something to satisfy you. You need something. You are hungry and you're craving anything. Think about it. If, if we had that same desire to get food after just skipping one meal, that same hunger to be able to walk in righteousness. Because the, the thing is, is that the world is hungry for happiness and it's starving. And the Bible says to be hungry for holiness and you shall be satisfied. Right? I, I, I like, um, I, I don't watch a whole lot of TV uh, being um, dad, master student, um, being in the reserves, all that. I don't have a whole lot of free time. However, I do like a show, I'm sure no one's really watched it, it's called Mad Men. Um, it's about uh, Madison Avenue admin in the 60s and 70s. I don't think it's really the best show for y'all to watch, but uh, I watched it in college, loved it. Uh, and there's a quote by this very famous admin. And he says, you know what happiness is? It's just a little bit more before you buy more happiness. You, you continue to accumulate and accumulate and accumulate. That's what, I'm, as a marketing major, I can promise you that's what the goal is, is to continue to get you to want something you didn't even know you needed or wanted. So I end up with five Amazon packages on my porch every other day, but something that we didn't need two days ago, but now it satisfies a need that wasn't there. Maybe you just aren't there. But it's true. They're, they're, that's what the world does. It, it, it sells you and it makes you desire things that you don't even want or need, and then you get it, you have it for about five minutes, and you want something else. You're not satisfied. You're not happy. And he's saying right here, the answer is, Hunger and thirst for righteousness, because then you will be satisfied. Okay, I keep going. Verse 7. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Ooh, that's hard. Right, we talked about a little bit on Sunday. I was really, um, mercy is not in our nature. When we say we have mercy, we have a really big misconception of what mercy means. And I think a lot of it has to do with, we're so quick to say, it's, okay hey listen i'm really sorry for, no, no no it's okay it's okay do we mean that is it actually okay how that person that talked behind your back they, they that that friend that you thought would never hurt you that they talked behind your back and said that thing or, or that they they bailed on you at the last minute when you were both excited to get and that they hurt your feelings they did something that deeply hurt you and, and they come up to you to maybe genuinely apologize and you, oh, it's okay, it's okay, it's good. A key component of mercy is forgiveness. If you don't genuinely forgive them, you cannot show them mercy because you, you're hurt. That's okay. You're, you're showing them mercy, right? And we've talked about the difference between mercy and grace, which really quick is that mercy is not getting what you do deserve. Grace is getting what you don't deserve. Both are key components of who God is. He is infinitely mercy and abundantly graceful, but gracious. But we as humans especially have a really hard time dealing with mercy. It's not in our nature. And even if we do, even if we do say it's okay, are we doing it with our fingers crossed behind our back, thinking, oh yeah, it's okay. Or fists fist clenched at our side, already having wheels turning of what we can do to slide you back a little bit, make an even playing field. It's not how mercy works. Mercy works means I forgive you, it's done, it's over, moving on, forgiven. And we don't do that. We have a fundamental misconception of mercy. Chuck Worrell's uh, professor at the seminary, I guess he was said it really well. He said, mercy involves more than generous giving to the needy. It also involves forgiving others for their sins as an expression of gratitude to God for his gracious forgiveness. We, we will never be able to forgive anyone as much as God has forgiven us. We are in no right to withhold forgiveness and mercy from anyone who is genuinely seeking it. And we need to forgive how many times? Rob hit it again on, on Sunday. Essentially infinitely. That, that's who we are, that's what we're called to be and called to do, is merciful, forgiving people. Verse 8, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. We 
struggle with pure head. Has anyone ever in your circles, like when you think of adjectives to describe your circle of friends, is anyone, the first thing they think of is they're pure? I'll, I'll, dude, I'll give you all the sodas in the fridge if you can tell me that that's the first thing you think of when you think of your friends. Yeah, that's the first thing I think. Okay, well, um, purity in that form is so rare, especially today. We don't think of it. When's the last time you called someone pure? No one. Like, that doesn't happen. That's, not, that's so rare because impurity is rampant. Right? Think about think about the purity of a diamond, right? Think about how rare it is to find one with imperfect, like it perfect, has no those black spots, perfect cut, all that stuff. It's amazing. And how much more accessible are impure diamonds? Blessed are the pure in heart where they shall see God. We really need to evaluate what is pure versus what is impure when we are thinking about things that come out of our mouth, that come into our mind, that are on our phones. Impurity is rampant. It's in our nature. Again, this is not an easy thing to counter. But it's important. Verse 9. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons and daughters of God. Back up there, blessed are the troublemakers. That's so much more relevant. Look at the world today. What which is more abundant, peace or trouble? And if you say peace, I direct you to um, Western Europe at this time, um, and I would strongly disagree. Blessed are the peacemakers. But, but as Christians, our definition of peace needs to be a little bit different than what even worldly peace between nations or whatever. First off, as believers, we know that peace should be primarily evangelistic because all throughout the Bible, from Genesis 3 on, are man and God at peace with one another? They're not. They're not at peace. And so we are at odds with God in our sinful nature after the fall in Genesis 3. So we know that first, the first peaceful relationship that has to happen before anything else needs to be between man and God. So we need to evangelize so that people realize that. Not that there's anything wrong with having peaceful relationships with friends. Yes, that's important. But the most important peaceful relationship has to be vertical. Again, it's a, a central theme throughout the whole Old Testament is the, the pursuing peace. That's why the, the Torah is implemented in Genesis through Deuteronomy. That's why the sacrificial system is implemented. That they're trying to their peace because there's trouble between man and God after sin entered the world. We have to be evangelists when we consider peace. Verse 10, we're going to go through 10 through 12. Uh, I piece them all together. As one, I think that they're one unit, uh, but that's just how I read it. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. First off, beginning of verse 10, blessed are those who are persecuted. What? Blessed are those who are persecuted. If they're being persecuted, they, they're not feeling blessed. They're feeling persecuted. They, they don't feel like they're receiving an abundance of blessings. But why are they being persecuted? For righteousness sake. That, that same thing that we're supposed to be hungry and thirsty for and craving constantly and chasing after and groaning in. That is why they're being persecuted. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Verse 11, blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you. Talk about 1 Peter 2.12. When they slander you, when they revile you. It's not an if, it's a when. Jesus says later in Matthew, I'm sending you out as sheep among wolves. It's not going to be easy. It's not promised. 
it's actually promised that the opposite will happen if you are genuinely a follower of Christ. They utter all kinds of evil against you falsely because of you? On my account, Jesus is saying on my account because you are telling them and showing them me. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Now, we look at the Beatitudes, right, and, and we think about the, in, the what the ramifications would be if we embodied this. Think about this. If you are pure in heart, if you are a peacemaker, if you were poor in spirit, you were humble, if you mourned over your sin and hated it, if you were gentle, if you hungered and thirsted for righteousness, if you were merciful, well, you probably, they probably elect you the next president. You would be, the world would be unstoppable. They would, they would make statues after you if you really embodied and embodied all these beatitudes, right? In fact, the only person that's perfectly embodied all of these was whipped, beaten, had his hair pulled out, crown of thorns and broken into his head, spat upon, carried his own cross up a hill to be crucified in the most gruesome death imaginable. And he perfectly embodied this, didn't mess up on any of them. And who are we to think, oh, I, I, just, I don't know about Jesus, I, my friends, they, they might, they might, mm. are you kidding me? The thing is, is that we need to keep in mind as well that the, the Beatitudes are not criteria for salvation. I said this at the outset, but I want to keep that in mind. These are not criteria for salvation, but they are signs of genuine conversion. This should be an outpouring, right? That this is Jesus targeting your heart. It's not saying, does he say anything about necessarily your actions? No, it is your heart, your attitudes that outpours into actions, but this is all inward targeting. So, what do we do now? Smooth transition. There we go. So, so what? One. The point of this is not to say, oh, if you do this, if you do this, if you do this, you can, you know, not by any means. Again, the whole point is that when we talk about us being human people with God, from the fall, and so we are saved. We cannot save ourselves by no means. If y'all don't know, uh, yes, Monday is uh, Halloween. Uh, does any of my church history buffs know what Monday is also? It is a day. It's what is it? All Saints Day, right? So all the way back in 1500s, our good friend Lauren Luther even though it is, there's a debate about when the Reformation actually started. But the Reformation started in the 1500s where they separated, Protestantism separated from the Roman Catholic Church, and the phrase justification by grace through faith alone was the firing point. It's what we cling to, not, oh, gospel plus confessions. Not gospel plus participating in the Eucharist or the Lord's Supper. Anything plus the gospel is not the gospel. And that's the whole point. And that's really for all those that now you know, you can go home and say, I want to learn about the Reformation. We cannot save ourselves. Two, we cannot think this is setting the bar too high. It's not applicable. Jesus wouldn't say, Oh, by the way, all these things that I outlined, you're not going to be able to do them. Good luck. Sorry. Now, are we going to be able to do this perfectly? No. We will need to continually rely on the Holy Spirit, but that's the whole point, is if you're doing this on your own, just trying to
and gut it out and make it look good, going through the motions to try and give off a facade that you actually know what you're doing and it looks good. That's not that's not the Beatitudes, that's not the point. It is applicable. All scripture is profitable for teaching, reproof, and you. We should be concerned about our heart because Jesus says this is the whole point of this section of scripture is your heart. When's the last time we actually sat down and did a self-evaluation of where our heart is, our priorities lie, where we're spending our time on, what apps we're spending time on? I know Izzy does it every Sunday. Um, that's always fun. But when we sit down and we actually evaluate, okay, if I just take a pause, just take a breath and realize, am I doing like a heart check? Like, is it like, do I know really where I am and that's why I'm doing well? I need to be more regular about that and be concerned proactively about where our heart is. It's important to Jesus, so it should be important to us. And we should rejoice when we are persecuted because that means we are faithful. That's a mind boggling concept. But it's saying here if things are starting to get easier for you, you're starting to compromise a little bit on the truth, but things are getting easier. Right, that, that dirty joke that you used to discuss that, now you laugh at, and you're almost partaking in. When, when your friend, it's not a Christian, takes the Lord's name in vain, and you used to tell him, don't do that in front of me, that, that's disrespectful of me, and now you, you don't say anything, or, or you start to slide some in just to be able to fit in. Or you know what the Bible says about certain things, but they're going to get mad at me. I don't know if they're going to talk to me about it anymore. You start to do that, and you start to, things get a lot easier for you. Just know you're straying away, and you're not faithfully following Jesus. You are following and serving the world. We talked about that last week. You either follow me or follow the world. You cannot serve two masters. The attitudes are a beautiful portion of scripture, so rich. The rest of the Sermon on the Mount, we're just getting started with it. I'm really excited to, to dive into uh, the teachings. And we're going to take it super slow. Uh, there's so much that we can dig into. And I hope that you guys will just come continue with a uh, expectant heart um, and continue to read ahead as we go through this. Okay? And thanks for the good food. I'm pray. Heavenly Father, uh, just thank you again for bringing us all here safely tonight. God, thank you um, for your teaching, for, for you showing us what a heart that pursues you looks like, what a heart that reflects you and loves others and is obedient and actually pursuing righteousness looks like. I pray that we would just discuss this well in our groups. Uh, and that we'd be able to apply it to our lives this week. I feel this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Peace out. Yep, go to your groups. Go to your groups. Wow.